Um, yeah, so the main aim of this paper will be to discuss the recurring images of borders and boundaries in the work of John Burnside, asking what their significance is in relation to his broader environmental concerns. Burnside's sustained engagement with the Heideggerian notion of how we dwell in the world has led to parallels being drawn between his work and Jonathan Bates' concept of eco-poetics. Indeed, his 2002 collection, The Light Trap, was highly praised by Bates himself, who, descri who described it as staking out the ground for a green poetry that will be as essential to our century as Wallace Stevens' luminous meditations were to the last. However, if eco-poetics is, as Bates puts it, a making poesis of the home, oikos, why does Burnside consistently make his home on what seem to be the borders or thresholds of the dwelling space? in doorways and darkened windows, along rivers, coastlines, and woods at the edge of towns. In this paper, I will argue that, for Burnside, these are spaces of creativity and potentiality, where we can question our perceived knowledge of the world, and perhaps acquire alternative understandings of our environment. More specifically, I will suggest that Burnside's poetic exploration of border spaces has allowed him to develop, to develop a more fluid concept of how we dwell in the world which may potentially overcome certain problems that Bate discusses in his final chapter of The Song of the Earth. The act of tracing and retracing the borders of the dwelling space, as Burnside does, could be seen to bear a resemblance to the old folk ritual known as beating the bounds. During this yearly activity, members of, co of a community would walk in procession around the boundaries of the parish, stopping at specific memorable sites and offering prayers of good crops for the coming year. The origin of the ceremony is unknown, with some writers linking it to the Christian Rogation Day and others tracing it further back to Celtic and pagan fertility rituals. In Once a Year, some, tra some traditional British customs, Homer Sykes suggests a practical element to the tradition, writing that, in a time before maps were widely available, beating the bounds was a useful method of fixing the boundaries of an area in people's minds. I find this ritual interesting because, while it allowed people to re-establish their knowledge and ownership of the land, it also served as a reminder of the limits of that knowledge and ownership. The offering, the offering of prayers along this boundary can be seen as a sign of respect and giving thanks for the parts of the world beyond human influence. In this paper, I will read John Burnside's explorations of border spaces as a kind of poetic beating of the bounds, an activity that allows him to mark the limits of the known world of the dwelling space and attempt to engage with a sense of mystery that exists beyond these borders. I'd like to begin by looking at one of Burnside's most recent poems, which exemplifies both the style and the recurring themes of his poetry. <coughs> it's more forest poetry. The Hunt in the Forest. How children think of death is how the shadows gather between the trees, a hiding place for everything the grown-ups cannot name. Nevertheless, they hurry to keep their appointment far in the woods, at the meeting of parallel lines, where everything is altered by its own momentum. Altered, though we say transformed, Greyhound to roebuck, laughter to skin and bone. And no one survives the hunt, though men return in threes and fours, their faces blank with cold. They never quite arrive at what they seem, leaving a turn of phrase or a song from childhood deep in the forest, bent to the juddering kill, and waiting while their knives slip through the blood, like butter or silk, until the heart is still. Like much of Burnside's poetry, this poem deals with the relationship between the self and its environment. It describes the effects we have on our environment, the way we culturally inscribe the forest as a fairy tale place of shadows and death, and the way that we physically make it such a place by hunting and killing the animals that live in, within it. But it also explores the effects that our environment has on us, the power it has to alter our thoughts and sense of self. <coughs> what allows Burnside to most fruitfully explore these ideas is the setting of the poem. As in Burn much of Burnside's work, we find ourselves here crossing over a border space, the edge of a forest, a boundary between the safety of the civilized world and the danger and uncertainty of the wild. By crossing this border, we enter into a world of the unknown, everything the grown-ups cannot name, and the unknowable, the meeting of parallel lines. Those who cross the border may lose something of their sense of self, leaving a turn of phrase or a song from childhood deep in the forest, but they may gain a different kind of understanding <coughs> of their environment, an understanding based on transformation and the interconnection of forms, something that cannot be defined but only glimpsed and felt, like laughter turning to skin and bone. In this poem, the exploration of this border space reveals something about our relationship with our environment, but this something cannot be quantified or even fully explained. 
This may all seem to suggest inconclusive, even mystical thinking. However, I would like to show how Burnside's embracing of the unknown has allowed him to overcome a very specific problem with eco-poetics that Jonathan Bates raises in the last chapter of The Song of the Earth. At the end of his book, Bates is still troubled by what he perceives as a binding dualism governing our relationship with our environment, and subsequently the way that we may conceive of eco-poetry. The poetic is ontologically double, because it may be thought of as ecological in two senses. It is either, both, a language, logos, that, returns, that restores us to our home, oikos, or, and, a melancholy recognising that our only ho home, oikos, is language, logos. I would like to focus on the tentatively parenthesized and question-marked words both and and in this sentence. Without them, Bates' eco-poetics is trapped in what he calls a Cartesian dualism. Either we are physical beings that dwell in the world and are one with our environment, or we are thinking beings and our only home is our man-made language. If, however, we replace the either-or with both and, then a middle ground opens up, allowing for a much more fluid concept of what it means to dwell in the world and of the relationship between our thoughts and our physical interactions with, the, with our environment. I would like to suggest that while Bates seems uncertain as to whether the both and formulation is possible, for Burnside, this essentially paradoxical view is at the heart of his poetics and philosophy of dwelling. This may seem to raise certain problems, hence Bates, parentheses and question marks. How can poetry both restore us to our home, enable us to dwell in the world, and recognise that our only home is in language, that our knowledge of the world is fundamentally limited? Or to put it another way, how can we dwell properly in a world that we can never fully know or understand? This seems like an impossible paradox but only if we assume that the aim of eco-poetry is indeed ontological, to provide us with an absolute understanding of the world. For Burnside, eco-poetry has quite the opposite function, to allow us to explore and engage with mystery and the sheer complexity of the world. As he writes in his essay, The Science of Belonging, Poetry as Ecology. While science at its best seeks to reduce our ignorance, it cannot and should not seek to eliminate mystery. The more we know, the more the mystery deepens. If poetry has a role in relation to science, it is to remind science of that universal truth. In this, it is also an essentially ecological discipline. For Burnside, we do not cross the border and enter into the woods in order to dispel the darkness and the unknown. We enter into the woods in order to explore mystery and uncertainty, and to harness the creative potential of these feelings. While Burnside calls his poetry a science of belonging, he makes it clear that we can only belong in the world if we turn our attention to the borders of our dwelling space, to the limits of our knowledge and ownership of the world. We should do this not with a view simply to expanding our knowledge and ownership, but rather with the aim of respecting and giving thanks for what we have and celebrating the mystery that may be revealed to us. For Burnside, the celebration of mystery is the start of any kind of inquiry into our place in the world. At the beginning of the poem, Unwittingly, he writes... I visited the place where thought begins, pear trees suspended in sunlight, narrow shops, alleys to nothing but nettles and broken walls. And though it might look different to you, a seaside town with steep roofs, the colour of oysters, the corner of some junkyard with its glint of coming rain, though someone else would recognise a warm barn, the smell of milk, the wintering cattle shifting in the dark, it's always the same lit space, the one good measure. In this poem, Burnside is clear about where we should begin our attempts to understand our relationship with our environment. The place where thought begins is always a borderland, whether an alley to nothing but nettles and broken walls, a seaside town, the corner of some junkyard, or a warm barn. The specific place makes no difference. What matters is their situation on the boundaries and edges of the dwelling space. It is in such places that we may leave behind our preconceptions, and may, as the title suggests, unwittingly, stumble upon new ideas. Wherever they are, these borders are, all, are described as always the same lit space, where alternative ways of understanding the world can be glimpsed. Andy Brown has identified this lit space as a recurring trope in Burnside's poetry, describing it as the gap between the self and other, between internal and external, between imagination and reality, between nature and culture. I would like to add to this by emphasising that the lit space is a gap but also a point of connection. It is a border that, like all borders, is at once a barrier and a crossing. The lit space functions as a meeting point of knowledge and uncertainty, of light and darkness, at once driving the darkness away, but also to a certain extent allowing it to encroach 
on the dwelling space and our own imaginations. This permeability is central to its function in that it allows the inhabitant of the lit space a glimpse of the world outside the bounds of their prescribed systems of thought. These glimpses are, for Burnside, where our most valuable knowledge of the world comes from, as he writes later on in Unwittingly. What we learn in the dark remains all our lives, a noise like the sea, displacing the day's pale knowledge. This space is where Burnside is able to engage with new ways of thinking and explore alternatives to rationalist ontological thought. In particular, these spaces are the sites in which the poet can question traditional philosophical views of the self as an indiv individual unity defined in opposition to the world and explore the more ecological view of the interconnection of self and environment. In the first section of the long poem by Pittenween, entitled Home, Burnside describes himself rebuilding the boundaries of his garden on the first day of spring. A cold blade clenched in my fist, or a length of twine, my body mapped and measured by the heft of work that must be done. Here the poet is not only marking the limits of his dwelling, but also of his self. In this poem, the action of beating the bounds allows for the self to be defined alongside the place, thus linking the two. In many of Burnside's poems, the borders of the home are felt physically, as well as being defined culturally. In the poem Halloween, the poet circumnavigates his parish, walking along, quote, boundaries of ice and bone. While parish borders may be culturally constructed, they are still felt to the poet, both externally in the ice of the landscape and internally in the bones of the body. The physical and imaginative linking of the self and the home is central to Burnside's poetry. It is only by recognising the limits of ourselves and the parts of the world that we call our own that we can hope to gain some understanding of the rest of the world. Burnside discusses this in his essay, Poetry in a Sense of Place, where he says, To exist, the person must maintain his or her bounds, both in order to exist as a separate individual and to have a space in which transactions can occur. Almost all of Burnside's poetry over the last 20 years can be read as a record of such transactions, or his attempts to create spaces in which they can occur. A good example of this is in the poem Geese, which recounts an instance of connection with the non-human world. The setting is another border space, a drive along the coast. When the poet sees a huge flock of geese, he gets out of the car and has a sudden unexpected physical reaction. I parked the car and stepped out to the rush of it, a rhythm I had waited years to feel in the meat of my spine and the bones of my face. He feels for a moment what he imagines the geese feel. He is reconnected with one of our most primal feelings, experiencing the idea of home at an instinctive, physical level. Homing in the purer urgency of elsewhere, which is nothing like the mind's intended space, but how the flesh belongs. Homing, belonging or dwelling, is shown here to be something that is less to do with the way we think of ourselves than, than the way we feel ourselves, physically, in the world. This insight comes from a moment of connection that the poet experiences with the geese, but importantly this moment of connection was not sought after. It was afforded because the poet kept himself apart and open to the possibility, the possibility of such an occurrence. What Burnside's poetry suggests is that by maintaining our bounds and trying to experience the non-human world more on its own terms, we can gain insights into alternative ways of understanding and dwelling in the world. In The Light Trap, Burnside summarises his view of the problem that we face in our relationship with our environment. This is the problem. How to be alive in all this gazed upon and cherished world and do no harm. Perhaps we can never be sure of doing no harm, but we can do less harm if we are attentive to the borders that mark the limits of our knowledge and ownership of our environment. Indeed, the best way of gaining an understanding of the world without doing harm is by not attempting to assert our own knowledge and ownership, but by acknowledging our limits and celebrating the sense of mystery and uncertainty that this affords. This may not lead to definite answers, which is why these border spaces must be traced and retraced, revisited year after year, as they are during the beating of the bound ceremonies. The notion of revisiting the same places and retracing the same patterns of thought can even be seen to influence the form of Burnside's poetry. His 2000 collection, The Asylum Dance, saw him experiment with a new kind of sequence poem, which has now become a hallmark of his verse. Often made up of only a few sentences, but spanning several pages, with lines running on across the titles of different sections. These poems, ports, settlements, fields and roads, 
all have very little punctuation, with Burnside letting the line breaks dictate the pace. Where there is punctuation, it is in the form of hyphens, colons, and semicolons, all used to signify a change or a new line of thought, but also a continuance and furtherance of the overriding themes of dwelling, belonging, and exile. In these poems, the repetition and remodulation of similar thoughts, feelings, and ideas gives the effect of an incantation, a charm, or prayer, a sense of a ritual retreading of the same ground and revisiting of the same sacred sites. Importantly, Burnside sees this repetition as central to the modification and development of his poetics of the self and the home. In Poetry in a Sense of Place, he writes, The act of locating oneself, central to the enterprise of lyric poetry, must be infinitely repeatable and modifiable. Otherwise, the sense I have of my place in the world becomes a static, meaningless fact. Each time we beat the bounds, we may appear to be doing the same thing, asking the same questions, but we always have the potential to discover something new, not static facts, but more fluid feelings and ideas. The borders of our self and our home may never change, but our understanding of our place in the world always has the potential to. It is not just the sequences of the asylum dance that can be read in this way. The repetition of theme the themes of belonging and exile and the ceaseless remodulation of thoughts and ideas about dwelling can be seen throughout Burnside's oeuvre. It seems quite clear that he does not return to these themes in the hope of finding an answer or of achieving closure, but rather because this act of repetition is the very process of dwelling in the world, of beating the bounds of the home. Burnside's poetry suggests that we live and dwell not in absolute knowledge of the world, but in an acceptance of our lack of knowledge. If we are to live in the world and do no harm, then we must accept our limits and find a way of renewing the borders of our dwelling space that is not oppositional to the world, but accepting of difference and open to the possibility that further knowledge may be revealed to us rather than pursued. In this sense, Burnside allows for the use of both and in Bates' statement that I addressed earlier. His eco-poetics allows us to dwell in the world precisely by reminding us of the limits of language and the importance of brace embracing new ways of thinking that allow for uncertainty and mystery. I hope I have gone some way towards showing the importance of the idea of beating the bounds to reading John Burnside's poetry, but it strikes me that this activity is prevalent in a great deal of contemporary eco-poetry and nature writing, from Alice Oswald's tracing of the river Dart and Robert McFarlane's walks along the edge of the wild, to Richard Mabey's unofficial countryside and Tim Robinson's circumnavigation of Aaron. I feel that this could provide fertile ground for further research. By teaching us to know our limits and accept the limits of what we know, the activity of beating the bounds may be as useful and necessary for helping us to understand our environment today as it has been for numerous cultures throughout history. Thank you very much.